Run. <laughs> 65 is 2023's American science fiction action thriller film by Sony Pictures, written and directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods, which stars Adam Driver and Ariana Greenblatt. I was thrilled when I first saw the trailer because it finally promised a dinosaur movie that didn't center around the Jurassic Park franchise. And don't get me wrong, I love the Jurassic Park franchise, but there's so much to dinosaurs that I was expecting at some point later, there would be another franchise surrounding dinosaurs or at least more movies. The only time I can recall being remotely entertained by dinosaurs outside of the Jurassic Park universe was with the 2005 King Kong film. While audiences seemed to enjoy the movie, rating it slightly above average, critics had a significantly different opinion and dismissed the movie entirely, giving it basically a 35% out of 100. That's not surprising, to say the least anyway, which is the reason why I almost automatically dismiss critic reviews. Can't trust them. They're not real. So the film starts out with Mills, our protagonist and a pilot stationed on a distant, technologically advanced planet of Samaris. Mills is grappling with emotional turmoil as he and his wife sadly discuss his departure on a two-year space mission in order for him to earn the funds necessary to treat his daughter's illness. He doesn't want to leave his daughter, especially when she's like this, getting sicker and sicker as time goes on. But as a father, he feels the pull to do something to help his daughter and for the chance to make her well. However, on the journey back to Samaris, his spaceship, the Zoic, weird ass name, is struck by a cluster of asteroids and plummets onto an uncharted planet. With the ship in ruins and his passengers all dead, Mills falls deeper into despair and contemplates taking his own life. However, his plans are disrupted when he discovers a sole survivor, a young girl named Koa, and resolves to take care of her. However, communication between the two becomes challenging due to them speaking different languages and a very conveniently broken translator. It's eventually revealed that they have landed on Earth 65 million years ago during the Cretaceous period period which was previously unknown to them as it was uncharted. Now this is a very interesting premise with some Battlestar Galactica points sprinkled in there but imagine an alien race crashing or crash landing on our planet a very long time ago only to discover it's filled with creatures who would take every opportunity afforded to them to annihilate you. I can't help but thinking when I watch movies like this that it would make for an interesting and amazing video game. Anyway I'm gonna go into what worked for this movie and what didn't work. Overall I definitely enjoyed it, and there might be a little bias there because it's a dinosaur movie and it's a different dinosaur movie. However, to put you at ease, if you're concerned about my bias ruining this review, <laughs> I've seen my fair share of dinosaur movies, particularly those made by Asylum, and I assure you, those are the bane of my existence, regardless of them having dinosaurs in them. So let's get into what worked. The film's action sequences were well executed, although I wouldn't classify this as an all-out action movie. In my opinion, the 2005 King Kong film better fits that description. There were significant periods of downtime in this movie, and the main focus was on the relationship between Mills and the young girl Koa, who he took under his care. While the action scenes are not necessarily unforgettable, they are captivating enough to hold your attention and keep you invested in the story, or at least what's currently in front of your face as you're watching. The CGI effects are impressive and the film successfully immerses you in its world. The colors and the visuals are realistic and the film's creators clearly invested a lot of effort into making the setting feel like the actual Cretaceous period. The next thing I absolutely loved about this movie was the dinosaur designs. One in particular, you'll recognize a lot of real dinosaurs in this movie and they definitely are going for the older design before we knew dinosaurs had feathers. This might make or break the movie for some people, but I honestly don't think it's that big of a deal because Jurassic Park for the majority of its franchise has also followed that style. It's understandable that the filmmakers aim to make the dinosaurs in this film appear scary and otherworldly rather than just believable reproductions of cloned dinosaurs. So the filmmakers chose to follow a style that was successful in the first Jurassic Park movie or the majority of the Jurassic Park franchise with the aim of making the dinosaurs appear more frightening and less like actual animals. Despite this approach, the creatures still manage to feel like they belong in the film's world and are a real presence in danger. Some of the dinosaurs, such as what I believe to be the Troodons, do have some element of feathery quills on their bodies. The color scheme of a lot of the dinosaurs make them look realistic and still like animals that could have existed. Also, there's a scene with the pterosaurs where I thought they were also going 
to attack because then it would have just gotten really annoying. But that's not what happens. They're literally just chilling out there on the beach, even though the girl is sitting there almost next to them. There's one dinosaur though, in particular, that I have no idea what it's supposed to be. This dinosaur has these long limbs and even thicker, longer back legs. Its tail is long and these dinosaurs seem to climb expertly. They look like real animals and the way they move is hypnotizing. They run on four legs and they look sleek and sexy, but I don't know what they're called. I don't know what they're supposed to be a representative of. Probably they're a new creature. Probably it's a stylized version of a dinosaur that already existed. The oviraptor, velociraptors, and what I believe to be Deinonychus seem to be very familiar based on their designs with some changes or rather designs that fit the stereotypical build that these dinosaurs have had for the majority of their time in media. The dinosaurs move quickly, but whenever they're large and imposing and running, you feel as though they're actually there and you actually feel your heart flutter a little bit because you can feel the weight to them, especially when they're in the distance. I always enjoy seeing them when they first pop up though. As for the relationship between Adam Driver's character and Koa, it's very sweet and to the point. We understand the motivation for saving her later, but throughout the movie, you can tell that they actually do care for each other. That brings me to the main character setup and motivation. Mills, the protagonist, the Adam Driver dude with the nose, lost his daughter and it's revealed later that she actually died during his trip. And it must have been absolutely shattering for him because for the last moments of her life, he could have been there with her, but he was away because he was trying to do something to save her. And I think I mentioned that he was on his way back. I don't know if he found the cure or he didn't. He could have been on his way to wherever as well. But anyway, he could not have known that she would have died. She just got worse. So with that void that his daughter left, he has a new sense of purpose for wanting to save this little girl, Koa, who's also lost her family. One of the reasons I appreciate this film is because it goes back to the basics. Many contemporary films and TV shows have abandoned the fundamental principles of linear character, motivation, and structure. While the characters in 65 may not have particularly complex depth, the film sets up their motivations in a way that allows the audience to connect with and care about the main character. Also, as for the concept, I'm sure the concept isn't new, but for me, I don't remember the last time I saw a movie where a main character human came from another planet and had to deal with animals that existed in our past. To them, it's a strange alien world with malicious creatures, and it has dinosaurs. I like the idea of them fighting the clock also to avoid the asteroid that's about to annihilate the reign of the dinosaurs. With all of that, let's get into what did not work. Now, although I absolutely enjoyed the movie. <laughs> there were actually a ton of things that did not work and were probably responsible for people being turned off to it or for this movie ultimately being one of those projects that end up not being memorable. There was too much time wasting in this movie. Don't get me wrong. I love the establishing shots, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when there is urgency and the characters choose to just stare at each other longingly or walk when there is imminent danger when they've been running earlier before. They act as though they're not in an urgent setting with asteroids killing things all around them and they're just choosing in that moment to stare at each other instead of launching and then you get upset at the characters because due to that time wasting event that is completely gratuitous an asteroid finally hits them and precludes their departure and you're just left wondering what was the point of doing that that being said for something that is supposed to be action oriented there is too much downtime there needs to be a way for the movie to breathe and i did like the earlier suspense when they saw the first dinosaur they also relied on jump scares by keeping your focus on something in the distance so you wouldn't ever detect something in the foreground jumping out and getting you which is exactly the way you would be hunted by some of these dinosaurs while i appreciated that there wasn't enough interest in the main characters and enough stuff happening during downtime for us to really care. They're walking and the bug lands on him and oh, it's funny because it's sticky and he can't get it off. The characters are trying to find a way to get over certain things or overcome certain obstacles in the environment or they're bonding with each other because Koa realized that Mills has lost something. What also doesn't help during the downtime is that these two don't speak the same language. When I realized that their translator was broken, I was about to get pissed off for two reasons. The first reason is that with all the fancy tech that he has, the main character, there's no translator device anywhere else, really? They don't have a backup or the device that he's using to pick up distance and to figure out what things are in the distance or what is good to eat and what is not. Does not have the ability to translate or guess. I don't know. And secondly, I was worried that they would use a cliched plot device where despite 
already establishing that these two characters can't understand each other, suddenly the person who doesn't speak the main person's language would miraculously start understanding everything that they're saying. For the most part, they do stay consistent with them not being able to understand each other, and while that's good because of the consistency, it can also hurt the character development because they can't have a meaningful conversation. However, you're supposed to look past that, and part of the point of showcasing the characters being from completely different cultures is that they can still connect with each other despite them not being able to understand each other through their dialect. It's hard to really connect with Koa when you can't understand what she's saying. The only thing you know is that she really wants her family, but that's all there really is to her. Compared to Mills, the main character, she has absolutely zero depth. Her screams are annoying, and even though she's not the worst child protagonist in the monster movie universe, <laughs> the only reason I care if something happens to her is for Mill's sake. And not necessarily because I care about her as a character per se. That's probably a result of there being such thickums plot armor. Oh my goodness, the plot armor is so thick in this movie. Near to the end of the movie, it becomes downright annoying. Upon being separated from Mills following the cave-in, Koa ventures out alone, presumably under the assumption that her companion is dead. Mills manages to escape later and attempts to rescue her from some dromaeosaur creature. He falls in quicksand and sinks while she's far away and somehow she knows exactly where he is, even though the quicksand is completely camouflaged with the rest of the forest floor and he's already sunk. Also, during the climax of the movie, Mills engaged in a fight against a four-legged meat-eating dinosaur near the acidic geysers. At that moment, Koa appeared by his side, conveniently catching up to him at an implausible speed. Not to mention Mills himself, after having shattered his ankle, is able to still outrun a much larger creature, which is galloping at full speed directly behind him, and you know that should have caught up to him a long time ago. The most vexing aspect of the movie is this aspect of plot armor that tends to recur repeatedly throughout the film, and is a common trope associated with child characters in the Jurassic Park franchise. So the dinosaurs are shown to immediately attack anything within their vicinity. And that has been how the characters were introduced and established, to show you how dangerous they are. But yet, they give the main characters enough time to be saved by another character, or the inexplicably odd choice that they always perform, which is to simply stare at the humans rather than attack, until the last moment when the plot knows that the humans will be saved. Oh, I cannot attack you or open my mouth to chomp around your leg or your nuts until the person that is going to save you is right next to you to pull you away at the last moment or shoot me. The whole time I'm screaming, what are they waiting for? It's like that scene with Sarah and the sharp tooth in one of the silly Land Before Time sequels. If you guys want to watch me lose my mind while reacting to the Land Before Time movies, check out my playlist on that. The other interesting plot armor is that we see Adam Driver's character getting sicker because we're to believe that his cut is getting infected that he got from the beginning of the movie because he did make a point to show it and it looked very gunky. However, that just becomes a non-issue very shortly after for some reason. Never to be mentioned again. I guess it just goes away. It's no, no longer concerned. Also, it was pretty annoying when the sexy leg dinosaurs brought down what looked like some kind of pterosaur only to immediately leave their carcass and hunt the little girl and then not eat her when she was right in front of them. They honestly need to stop doing stuff like that in dinosaur movies with kids. They did actually put her in danger by putting some kind of larva thing in her mouth when they were in the cave and she was sleeping and it was disgusting, but she was just immediately much better afterwards. Like, no sickness, no adverse, latent effects. I'd like to see a little bit more stakes than just her screaming and being scared. In conclusion, 65 was a fun adventure. I'm definitely not sorry that I saw it. It's a different take on the dinosaur genre, and I would love to see more of this. At least it took a risk. I think they did a good job by making it very simple, and I think there could have been a little bit more action and maybe a tiny bit more depth, but it definitely was a fun movie, and I think it's worth a 6.5 rating out of 10. Thanks so much for watching. This has been Ulteori. You ask, we answer.